Talk. I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. I'm Pyrosin. And I'm Snake. <laughs> Sen's hitting the liquor already. <laughs> it's that kind of show tonight. He's not very confident, is he? <coughs> or he's excessively confident. Welcome to Grab Bag 2013. Uh, yeah, so I guess by the time this goes up, it'll be, what, March 6th? Which means that all of the games ever will have come out yesterday. Uh, yeah, seriously, a lot came out. Um, Sims 3 University Expansion came out, which Yay. I have no time to play right now, so that'll happen probably next month, maybe, when I get back from my house-sitting gig. And, yes. uh, uh, Tomb Raider came out. Yay, and Laura! Yay, so Square Enix! Still you guys can look forward to a awesome. review from me for that next week, because I have had no time to play it, because it came out today when we were recording this, and... But she owns it, so... But I have it, yes. So, so progress. Can, so you can comment on the box art. Lara, Lara's very dirty in all of the box art. <laughs> that seems to be a big staple these days. She's very filthy. Yes. I'm not sure if it's dirt or blood or probably both. Some combination of both and somewhere in between. Uh, Sen's been she's... reading comics and doing more miniature gaming stuff. Uh, Pyro, have you been doing anything? I have unfortunately not played any video games whatsoever. I've made plans uh, shame to yourself, see sir. the... Oh, man. Brian Singer has a Jack and the Beanstalk movie that is uh, like, yes. either out or coming out. I'm going to see that at some point. I've made plans. It's out. It came out last Friday. But we all know Brian Singer as the director who made the good X-Men movies versus the directors who made the bad X-Men movies, so... I, I'm going to go ahead and trust my instincts on going after him, even though Jack the Giant Slayer has gotten terrible reviews. I'm optimistic. I, I Sorry. forget, was it Brian Vaughn uh, that uh, made the really good X-Men movie, First Class? Uh, Brian Singer was First Class, actually. Really? No, yes. no way. Yes, it was. Crazy, he was huh? the director. All right, then. He, I want some he did X-Men 2000 and X2 and then bailed for X3, <laughs> Was not did not have anything to do with Wolverine, and then came back on for First Class. He was the one that saved the franchise. Anyhow, and uh, most importantly... Snake, you have been playing the brand spanking new, just released Mass Effect 3 Citadel DLC. So, yes, could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I can tell you this the spanking really hurts. So, <laughs> when they say spanking new, they, uh, just just go for the new part. Everything else, you, you can just skip that, okay? Unless you're into that, which, no, uh, no judgment here. Yeah, but that's I'm a whole different kind of radio butt. show, anyway. <laughs> but yes, I, I'm a big Mass Effect fan, as I'm sure. Well, lots of geeks are these days, but... Um, <laughs> Anyone who listens to this show? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Everybody on the show, literally. I'm not sure like, you're allowed us to not be tattoos? a huge Mass Effect fan. <laughs> you know, I, I actually had not considered tattoos, but now that you mentioned it, it's going on a very short list of candidates. An N7 would be nice. Just saying. I do have Here's a uniform. Jack. Hmm. Well, thoughts for later. But yes... The new Mass Effect DLC, Citadel, which is basically Bioware, has gone on record saying this will be the final one that's the last hurrah for the entire, well, this particular Mass Effect team. They've already said they're going to continue on with the universe later, but this is the last thing with Shepard, at least as we know it. Who knows? They could be planning all kinds of things with Shepard or not. But, well, where do you start with this? <clears throat> I guess you can start by saying that there's going to be major spoilers or so, and I'll try to stay away from that, but... So... <laughs> Basically, we're warning you now. We're probably going to spoil this. Here comes uh, the spoilers. Yeah, well, I ha I haven't played the whole thing. <laughs> okay, it, so partial spoilers. One, partial spoilers, or so. Although I have already seen like the main shocker or twist, you might say in this, which I'll definitely avoid saying because it's a good one. I was going to say I, I I might be mad at you if you do that. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine so. The the problem with the, well, the problem is having any kind of twist or anything in a franchise like Mass Effect that everyone loves so much. Uh, well, you're going to have the people who are gonna absolutely love it, or everyone's going to analyze it, that saying, oh, they stole from this, 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 and it's got shades of this, and like, yeah. It's just... Everything's derivative now, though. Yes, yes. It just gets a little tiring, but I don't What's know. What's the hook for the DLC? I imagine at the very least, uh, you can go start it from the saved state before you go and attack the Cerberus base. I well, the first, How early the first thing which, the game can um, you go after it? By the time this podcast airs, Mass Effect 3 will officially be one year old, so mm -hmm. shame on you if you haven't played it. Yeah, that was the whole thing. This is the one year anniversary. Well, for the first thing, this is a two-part DLC, apparently. 
you actually you actually have to pay for the first part, one of two, and then you have to download the second part later, which is which is free. <laughs> which um, is free. Basically, apparently. it's gotten split up because it's so freaking huge. It is four gigabytes yeah. total, so they split it up into two two gigabyte downloads. Yes, indeed, and that is what happened. I made the silly mistake of just downloading the first one and not re- and not realizing the second one wasn't it automatic. It will not work without the second. So yes, yes. Yeah, but I, like most people, um, will probably be starting the DLC from just before you attack the Cerberus base, because if you're like me, then you've already done the ending a few times, which we will not be getting into, I must say. I must say, that is uh, ending. I, whatever. I'm not getting into that. But if you're like me, you'll have gone through that, and you'll be very sad that the entire Mass Effect universe, or at least Shepard's universe, is over, and you'll play through again, and you'll stop right before Cerberus, and then just not go back to it, because you don't want the game to end. Or at least that's how, what I did. So yes, you can start right from the point just before you're about to attack the elusive man's base, and then you get, well, like, a, like all DLC, you get a message. <clears throat> In this one, it's Admiral Hackett literally ordering you to go, to go have some shore leave. He's saying everyone needs some rest. Go to the Citadel. Take a break. That's an order. And we're repairing the and we're repairing the Normandy. That seems so, anticlimactic so for that so point in the story. It is like, oh, the survival of all life in the galaxy is at the stake of a matter of minutes. So better take a break. Go, go take a breather. Go give Arya some of your money. Well, no. Ar- well, I don't know if Arya is involved with this or not, but um, in my case. This is already... I've already done the Omega DLC, so this will have been technically right after we have already helped retake Omega. So, she's already building, rebuilding that, so she wasn't really there at all. Not in Afterlife or anything. But, um... But, yeah. So you have... So you head over to the... To the... To the Citadel. And just like the... Just like the Leviathan DLC, you go there and you get two options. Either going to the main... Citadel areas, or to another section. In this case, it says private dock or private or private quarters. You go into the building and you get this really nice, uh, this really nice apartment that used to be Anderson's apparently. And he gives you and he tells you on Bidcom, Shepard, you just take it. You you need a place. You need a place to stay. I'm kind of screwed on Earth right now, uh, but I'm fighting for my life. But it's cool. You can crash at my place. Yeah, just take it off my hands. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna die here, so you can just have it. And I have to tell you, the whole place is freaking sweet. But I mean, don't I'm eat a... the cake in the fridge. Do not eat the cake in the fridge. That's my, That's my cake. cake. That's my cake. Nobody else's. You stay away from that cake. Someone needs to make a gif of just the fridge that has uh, has a cake in it that will note that says Anderson's cake. Oh, I'm sure there will be, because there is a fridge there. You can't open it, but there is a fridge. I mean, it's a really nice apartment. I mean, there's, like, two big living rooms, there's a kitchen and dining room, you have, like, three bedrooms, you get a small gym with a punching bag, you get an upper balcony area, all kinds of bizarre artwork. Not quite impressionist, a little bit after that, I don't know. But, and you get, and you get three bathrooms, one that has a big square jacuzzi in it, so if there is not some because hot tub... that's what Shepard needed. A hot tub? You, well, hell Yeah! So, if you're what not... this sound lo- so far, what this is sounding like is we decided to mix The Sims with uh, Mass Effect. I know, right? But something I'm actually kind of getting Smash shades of Skyrim's Hearthfire DLC. You know, build right? your house and get well, married. I, actually, actually, crazy enough, it looks like there is a, a mechanic that lets you switch out like the furniture and the bedroom and the bathrooms and get different ones for later. Right now, everything's, everything's on default. But it looks like you can get other furniture and place it into different spots. You can customize your place. All right, I'm not, then. I'm not, I'm not kidding. That's that's seriously a thing. So it's sounding like you're paying 1,200 Microsoft points for a customizable crash space. Oh, but there's, well, but there's more. There's more. Okay. You go, you go around to the entire apartment and you, get, and you see a little, <clears throat> and you see a little uh, uh, journal entries from Anderson's biography. So you get to hear a whole bunch of backstories of him. Meeting his first Spectre, which is a really awesome story, by the way. Uh, talking about Shepard, talking about when the Normandy was built and how yeah, he was kind of... Wasn't, wasn't that actually the plot of the Revelations book? Uh, I guess, but this just goes into the depth of things that weren't involved with Revelations, I guess. I mean, I've read all the I've read all the Mass Effect books, and what he tells about wasn't specifically in those. He doesn't even really mention Saren that much. But does all kinds of... But does a good job of giving uh, Anderson some more backstory and listening to Keith Davis's awesome voice. Um, 
but it's got some but it's got that good bioware writing so you do have to click and just stand there for a while and admittedly when you think it's over you turn and then nope nope there's more okay it's done nope, nope there's more like it can't get a little grueling sometimes but it, but it, but but I'm a guy that's really big on story so it didn't bother me that much so so yeah you get customizable furniture and you get to hear about Anderson's past and then oh the best part once you once you finish all that you get an invite from Joker and you get to go to this awesome sushi bar on the Citadel yeah, that's one of the cool things. You get to go once you once you leave the place, you get to fly around in one of those hover cars and see some more of the wards around Citadel. Like around the, the Citadel. little taxi things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The things that looks like a, a flat flying mitten. Um, <laughs> oh, seriously, don't they look like that to you? <laughs> Best like description a, ever. It looks flat like flying. a met, it looks like a mechanical flying mitten. Seriously, you will not be able to unsee it next time you see them. It's kind of like your cat's face. That too. Yes. No, but you get to see, but you get to see more of the Citadel, and I love seeing parts of the Citadel. I'm not sure about you guys, but that was one of the things that kind of ticked me off in Mass Effect Two was that you barely got anything on the Citadel mm-hmm. first go around. I mean, this big, massive place, and you and you only go to a few levels of it, mm-hmm. but you get to see a whole lot more of it. <clears throat> so the design is great. I'm not so sure about the music. Yeah, that's the thing. In the house, you also get different songs that you can play. Is it the same playlist that also exists in your personal quarters on the Normandy? No, 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 no. This seems to be this seems to be all new music. And the thing is, though, I went through each of the different songs. And it sounded almost like they went through different genres and tried to make them spacey. There's one that sounded almost like a polka. One that sounded like it was something out of the '80s. One thing that sounds like it was trying to be rock and roll. It, it really loves. Yeah, basically, I'm not sure about polka, but it sounded a little bit more country style, country techno, spacey kind of stuff. It, it let's just say Anderson needs a fix on his presets. Yeah, it's too bad there's no way to fix that. But uh, so yeah, the music left something to be desired. It didn't really do much for me. And that's my review. There you I'm, go. <laughs> I'm going back to Sen's comparison to The Sims on this one because, one, that's exactly what The Sims does with the Simlish music, but now I really want Elcor cover bands of real songs, just singing lyrics Elcor. in, like, totally drawl tones. Know, I'll, I'll, Explaining the intent behind each of them. With my mind on my first. money and my money currently on my mind. <laughs> exactly nice. so. Expletive. Um, Boo yeah. Yeah, as uh, I'd have to watch the trailer for this one, but if this is literally just a short <laughs> adventure of uh Shepherd okay. on Shore Leave Metaphorically it doesn't sound that entertaining. God is a DJ, ah, life is but, a dance floor. Ah, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I've teased you guys enough here. No, to be perfectly honest, that's all just the intro stuff to make it seem like you're getting on basic shore leave. Okay. But and then, when, surprise, when, dun, 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 you shoot things. Explosions. Well, actually, yes. What <laughs> happens... And this is in the trailer, so this isn't spoiling anything, though. What happens is you're at the sushi bar, you're talking with Joker, and Seth Green gets some more awesome lines, because... Oh you my know, gosh, jo- that's amazing. Jo- Joker's awesome. I yeah, love get, his lines. Oh yeah, you get, more, you, get, you get a lot more Joker in this one. <sighs> you get a lot more everyone, but... Yeah, you're sitting there, you're talking with Joker, and he says, well, thanks for sending me that email, Joker. It's like, what, I thought you sent me one. And then at that moment, you're like, oh, shit. And then suddenly this woman comes charging up saying, Commander Shepard, someone's trying to kill you. And Joker says, yes, we know that already. No, 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 this is someone else. And then, boom, these new guys show up and start shooting everything. Apparently not fans of sushi. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, apparently they are not. But everything starts going all all haywire and stuff. and suddenly, before you know it, you're crashing down through the floor, hanging for dear life from a from an advertisement board, and smashing down into the lower levels of the wards. So yeah, okay, it looks so there cool. is more adventure to this than here's an extra playroom. Oh, there's lots more. Okay, he's oh, just you... trying to be nice and not spoil things. Yes, Appreciate I'm just trying. I'm trying not to go into the most detail, but yes, it starts out all nice, warm, and fuzzy, but then. Before you know, well, how are you before, liking it? Are you having fun with it? Is oh, there, I am, is, oh, I is am there enjoy- a good balance of story versus combat? What would you say the ratio is? Oh, I'm enjoying it quite a lot. The odd thing is, though, okay, if I was to make a comparison with previous DLC that they've already sent out, the first one that comes to mind, mo- the one that comes to mind most in comparison with this, is the one for Kazumi. 
in Still um, a memory, huh? Yeah, in Mass Effect, in Mass Effect Two. So her by which one. you mean it's a lot of like world building and story stuff, but not like a lot of combat. It adds in more combat elements into it from what I've seen so far, but it's a slightly different style. Because the thing is, at the very beginning, the gun that you get. Because you're just going on shore leave and you don't have a gun with you, so you steal one from one of the guys attacking you, and it's actually a, one with a silencer. And so they actually suggest trying to not get attention by taking guys out you're with a silencer. You're playing a stealth mechanic? Oh my god, this is well, amazing. Stealth effect. Well, well, no, the thing is, though, the, it seems like what the stealth is, try to get the guys before they can call in for backup. Uh, now, you see, my guy, my she, my fem shep, which is who, I, who I'm playing as... <clears throat> just saying, my infiltrator... Could turn invisible, so not well, that they, hard. Well, they, well, there you go. Well, yeah, the thing is, mine is the class that's made for this scenario. I'm just saying, I love stealth. I love stealth too. Yes, especially well, the infiltrator's double yes, one. My because you have a... the active camo, and you also have the perks that do uh, multiplicative damage mm -hmm. to headshots from your sniper rifles when you're in active camo. So you are in every sense built to kill the enemies before they can do anything. Hmm, true. But, the, yeah, in my case, my shepherd is not particularly very quiet, because, what's what, which is the one that combines the tech and the bio, and the biotics? You are playing a sentinel. A sentinel, that's it. Yeah, so mine... I know, actually just started an Insanity Mass Effect 2 run as one of those. Well, there you go. I really like it, because I like mixing <laughs> I the tech no with the biotics. I had no idea what I should pick, so I went with that. <laughs> I'm kind of all over the place. I have... A sentinel that uses a N7 Valkyrie, so I have a sniping technician biotic. So I, I, so I'm indecisive. There you go. I couldn't make up my mind, so I just picked everything. <clears throat> no, but mine is not very subtle, not very quiet. But the way it's designed, I, I think, is you have the option for the stealth. But if you don't want to go that route, it doesn't break the game. It's just you just have more guys you have to fight. Is what it seems to be, and that keeps going on throughout the rest throughout the rest of that particular mission. Um. So it's slightly different, but it's not so much that you have to play this one way. We have to be a bit more stealthy. Like, um, um, oh, what was it? It was DLC for the second one. It was, um, the, the... Arrival? Yes, that one. The one where you have to, where you're by yourself at the very beginning. Yes, and, that's Arrival. Yes, well, where you're, where you're by yourself the whole time. Mass that Effect one has a nice spectrum of DLCs because it's like Shadow and Broker. And they all play so differently from each other. Yeah, true. It's all... They're all just, they're all over the place. This one, from what I've played so far, seems to be a nice bit of a balance. I mean, I, there's definitely a lot of there's definitely a lot of um, story building in this. And it has one of my favorite, my absolute favorite parts in this, and well, probably my favorite part in all of the Mass Effect universe. I keep <clears> seeing in the promotional material that Rex is going to be in it. And oh I'm yeah, excited about that. Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> Rex I mean, apparently it, also taking shore leave. Oh yeah, uh, well yeah, they explain that. Well, they explain everything there. Well, from the looks of the of the uh, the trailer, it looks like everyone that you've met that or that played a really significant part, you know, from Rex to Jack to Miranda or everyone else, anyone that's still hey, alive, Sam, obviously. Get Miranda back. Oh yeah, oh yeah, Sam. If you're if you're romance Miranda, you need to take a look at the trailer because it, because uh, they have a shot of her in a in one of those really tight fitting, revealing formal dresses. And it's red. Yeah, the unfortunate thing about going back and playing my current save is I believe the saved data is currently held right at the ending. Ah, so that can be problematic. So I have to do a full run. Well, there you go. Because the game won't rewind to right before you launched the... I uh, thought it does an autosave of right before you attack the server space, generally. Maybe. I'd have to check. No, it, it definitely, definitely does. And I, I believe it even saves it in a slot that's like slightly harder to overwrite than the other slots. That'd it be keeps nice you a DLC really ready not, save. I'm really mm -hmm. not happy with the second playthrough I did where I broke up with Miranda and went for Ashley, you know, space uh, racist extraordinaire. I told you that was a bad idea. <laughs> I like Miranda. I just I like Miranda too. With the ending situation. <laughs> that uh, I get to have a video conference call with you to say goodbye. All What's right. Hey, what did I say about the ending? Anyway. But so <laughs> let's talk actually, about the Star Child. I'm kidding. What? No, no. Well, actually, actually, no. Sen, actually, Sen, I think this is kind of, I think this particular DLC is actually in response to the same problem that, that you have and that a lot of fans, including myself, had at the very end, just before you actually do the final assault, in which is you just 
the, your last encounter with Jack and Grunt and all the others is just a video conference. Now, yeah. Absolutely, yeah, I'm just going to Skype. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I have fully agree with that. But as you can see, this time... Just love you, probably going to die. Yeah, let's just Skype this. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, it seems like this is definitely making up for that. Yeah. In that, it seem, it, especially from the trailer, it looks like everyone is going to have... You know, their their time their time to shine, and it looks like whoever you romance, you will still get to say the be they someone who's still in the Normandy or someone like Jack who's elsewhere at the time. Yeah, Miranda was leading fighter raids, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yes, yeah, there. Ship, so, ship and- so yeah, you get a chance to be you get a chance to be with everyone at this time, and which I which I really which which I'm really glad for because something that was really bugging me in some of the uh, in. Mass Effect 2 is that right at the very end when you're about to uh, launch the suicide mission after you've crashed you go around and see individual uh, crew members but they're always in their own spot looking off camera at someone else you never you only rarely see them all together you do see them all together at the very end of Mass Effect 3 but it's never like a really big group shot or something and I just wanted to see more of everyone interacting with each other and this one Already, I've seen several shots of them just all coming together and all of them just bantering around with each other. We, we've had a few meetings around a table where they're just shooting the shit back and forth. Tally and Rex just throw one or two lines back at each other. <laughs> it's all fun. That's what I was saying. This is my favorite part of Mass Effect. It's one of the best things that lets this be such a massive, complex world is the banter between everyone. You see, and, and that's partly, I think, because... Mass Effect 3, Commander Shepard, I'm going to go out and say, not a strong character on its own. It's it's a pair of pants or a t-shirt that you can throw on. It's the and, Batman complex. And so it takes the form of, and it's 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 good in the RPG sense in that, you know, Shepard becomes whoever you want him or her to be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But by virtue of that, Shepard can't be a strong definitive character. No, the strength Those of from... Yeah. Th- th- those, dim- those, like, multidimensional, complex, multifaceted characters that we've come to love Bioware for are in the NPCs. Yes. That's what, yeah, that's what, that's where the whole world comes from. That's why, yeah, it doesn't feel like you're really controlling Shepard. It just feels like you are Shepard because you're putting yourself into this character and interacting in this world, meeting all these different people. And this one really fleshes that out. (laughs) On one of the raids, you, and again, this is in the trailer, but it's, uh, one of the raids you take, you take everybody. You have your own little squad, but everyone else is supporting you, like from the catwalks or somewhere else. So you get to hear banter back and forth between everybody, and you even get to hear some of the bad guys commenting, "Oh, they got Krogan down there," and "Oh, wait, wasn't that Archangel?" And it's all, and it's all great. Okay, it, it, this inspires me to a proposal. Obviously, Bioware wants to make more Mass Effect games, but they're in a bit of a pickle considering the ending of Mass Effect 3 can go various ways, and you have to pick some state of the universe in order to make a sequel. And regardless, you probably don't have a Shepard. So here's what they should do. They should make an Ocean's Eleven licensed video game with all of the Mass Effect characters just pulled out of the Mass Effect universe and just stuck in Ocean's Eleven. It'd be perfect. I mean, Mass Effect 2 already has the story structure of Ocean's Eleven. You make the team and you do the heist. Just just the put thing, the characters in a new setting. You know, the weird thing is, is I, I actually had my own thoughts on... I was making some comparisons to Ocean Eleven while playing the first parts of this DLC, believe it or not. I actually had that same thought. All right, sign me up. When you can compare it to Ocean's Eleven, I don't regard that as a bad thing. No, 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 I agree, but... No, everyone gets... So far, everyone gets a time to shine, and for everyone that loves Rex, and let's face it, everybody loves Rex, he gets a... <laughs> when he showed up in... When he, when we got to see him showing up in the DLC, and I won't spoil how he does it, because you, you just gotta see it, but suffice it to say, I actually had to pause for a moment and just go, hell yeah, and I had to throw my fist in the air, because it was so awesome. Because it's Rex. How else is he gonna enter? He's gonna make a kick-ass entrance. That's just, that's just what he's gonna do. But, um... Okay, so favorite Mass Effect DLC. Ooh. Hmm. You only have two choices. Oh, and what's that? Citadel or Shadow Broker. Well, and those Duke. Well, yeah, you could say that. You definitely say that because those two, well, basically advance the plot the most. Well, considering Sh- Shadow Broker isn't technically even DLC, it's part of the game. Because you have uh, to play. Here's a question: it. Do we consider From Ashes DLC? Uh, uh yes. Is that infinite quest? Inf- infamous question. 
And all because, of the Javik interactions that go along with that. Because I'd say a lot of Mass Effect does not make sense without it. I would consider From Ashes to be DLC for the reason better. that I didn't get to play it. it I purchased <laughs> Mass Effect 3 on the PC, and in my first playthrough, it just was not part of my game. It was not available on the PC yet, I believe. Oh, wait, From Ashes? Oh, yeah, good yeah, point. Sorry, from I, Ashes with Javik? Yeah, sorry, I was thinking with, The Arrival. Was, my it, mistake. was it the collector's editions, or was it just new copies? I believe it was part of the Project Ten Dollar. Right. Yeah, oh, the Project okay. Ten Dollar, but it was it was yeah it was it was first day DLC stuff, and that was another big thing that everyone that was that was one of the two biggest arguments that people had with yeah, Mass no, Effect Three. You actually had to buy the content if you got the regular version of the game. It wasn't a part of Project Ten Dollars where it came with it, because the GameStop clerk when I purchased my copy of Mass Effect Three at launch actually asked me would you like to buy the DLC as well? Which I didn't quite understand. And when I said yes, he basically charged me another $10 for the game, and it printed out a code that I entered into uh, my Xbox Live, which unlocked and it. since I bought the collector's edition, it just came bundled with it, yeah. Sen's explanation makes sense to me, because, yeah, it, I didn't play, I didn't have it when I played through, and that must have been because it wasn't part of the Cerberus network, it was just extra DLC that came with the collector's edition. Yeah, well, the problem with things like um, From Ashes, Shadow Broker, and almost in some ways the Citadel DLC now, <laughs> it doesn't even feel like actual, like normal DLC, in that it's branching off from the main story. It seems like it's a, actually, you know, part of the main story. I mean, heck, you make a, an argument for Leviathan, because you've played Leviathan and seen the ending of that, it's kind of substantial. Almost all of it is. Yeah, Mass Effect 3 did a really good job of tying in all of the DLC to the greater narrative. Oh, whereas true. some of the DLC in Mass Effect 2 wasn't so great along those lines. Well, the biggest argument, of course, is Arrival with that one. Not just in the way the gameplay works, but how it fits in with the story. I believe it is a widely held opinion in the gaming reviews community that the BioWare 2 DLC Minerva's Den is a better game than BioWare 2, or than Bioshock 2. Minerva's Den? Yes, like no that DLC, standing alone by itself, is just a better game than the base game of Bioshock 2. And for DLC like Shadow Broker, those stand alone as pieces of content that are really complete experiences if you do that in one sitting and something else in one sitting. Shadow Broker can compete as a game with some other games. Not, I mean, obviously Mass Effect 2, but with a lot of just regular games that you could find on shelves. So yeah, like, it's, it's hard to relegate the them to DLC, DLC status. Okay, I get, yeah, I guess what you mean. And yeah, that's, that's something Bioware is very good at. So they've been... I mean, lately they've been the ones that have been sh actually doing that combination of gameplay and storytelling that's so hard to come across these days. And as I've mentioned before, and Pixie definitely knows this, I'm all, I am love a good story, especially when it ties into the gameplay the way Mass Effect does. To go on a bit of a tangent, uh, StarCraft II Heart of the Swarm is going to be released on March 12th, which is, like, that is the upcoming Tuesday. And that will require... Wings of Liberty in order to play it, but it's forty dollars instead of sixty dollars. This is an expansion pack from back when we had expansion packs instead of DLC. But it no just goes to show that, that the lines are a little blurry. It's forty dollars. So, so this is all the way back to Brood Wars now, huh? Pretty much. Uh, the old days of the expansion packs. But it's also just a whole game, so... Yeah, you're, mm -hmm. you're effectively getting the same package that you got with StarCraft II. You're getting a large single-player campaign with its own achievement system, and then you're getting the multiplayer component of the game. Plus you're getting the, uh, I forget what they called their design-your-own-game mode, but you're getting that again with a revised tool set, um, which has been phenomenal. I mean, things like Either Chef or uh, Star Jeweled, those are amazing little creations that it's it's great that they could be done in-engine for the game. Those are just neat. The legacy of so the StarCraft of 2 map again. creator is obviously goes I mean, back to I, I don't, the StarCraft 1 map creator, and in the, the middle is the Warcraft 3 map creator is where we got content, Dota, the, which is where we got League and story, all modern MOBAs. The new, so. Keep recording. Uh, the new uh, multiplayer units, 
Like, I'm willing to throw down the 40 bucks for this. Mm -hmm. But let's not get too far away from Mass Effect. I just wanted to point out that calling it merely a DLC sort of does not recognize the truth of the situation very well. Not true. Because in this way, this almost seems like a separate game in of itself, too. But it's but definitely is DLC in that it's probably going to be based significantly on, well, the characters at least. The atmosphere you're going to have with who is around you is going to change. And and like you were saying, Sam, just the continuation of, of a particular world would be worth it just just enough for that for the emission, just for the fee. There's definitely going to be a lot of that with this DLC, too, because if you've seen the trailer at all, there are tons of shots of literally everyone on the crew lined up and shooting guns down at enemies. And so just having that idea, just that feel of all-out war with your whole team that you haven't, that the, the only time you ever actually, the last time you felt that was actually with the suicide mission in Mass Effect 2, when you actually saw everyone fighting the collectors on, on their base. Now you're getting to see your entire squad supporting you. Yeah, you Which, really have to think this is not fair for those guys. Yeah, really. Yeah, that's... <laughs> and to spoil one little line, it was well, while you're attacking and Garrus is up above, one of them shouts, Hey, isn't that, isn't that Turian Archangel? How do we kill him? And Garrus responds, You don't. Yeah, I can see Garrus responding that way. Oh yeah, you just get you just get tons of that. Literally, there's just one where all of them get their get a little one-liner about... We're shooting guys right now. It's just everyone's saying we're shooting people, but in their own particular way. And it's exactly how you'd expect each of them to act. I mean, <laughs> I'm all giddy right now just because so I... W the, the question is, if they're all there, what on earth is going on with the places in the universe that they're supposed to be? I mean, part of the idea of why they couldn't be there to help you at the end of the game was they were each busy with their own part of the fight. I mean, Miranda was leading her strike force... Jack was on the ground leading the biotics. Uh, Grunt was leading the Krogan civilization in their fight. Well, yeah. It was. Did they all just like, we'll be back in two weeks. Later, guys. Well, okay. Well, I, well, I mean, I've got all this accrued vacation time, and if I don't spend it at the end of the month. <laughs> it doesn't carry well, Jack over. Jack gets really after... pissy if you tell her that she has to hold off on her vacation. Yeah, these those days do not carry over Reapers and no Reapers. <laughs> right? So everyone no, well, just said screw it and took a vacation to go see Shep. Okay, well, I have like I said, I'm still near, I'm still near the beginning of the whole DLC. So the only get, the only person that isn't in the that's not on the direct crew with me right now is Rex. So he's the only so one what, right um, who we know is coming. How much yeah. time have you put into this so far? Um uh, I'd say about an hour and a half or so, give or take. And you still feel like you've only barely gotten into it. I'd say that's well worth the like what twelve bucks. I'd say so because it, yeah, it's, it's because again, ten dollar pack or no, uh, it's like th twelve, 12 ninety nine. So it's like thirteen dollars. Yeah, and I and I say so far for what I've had, I'd, I'd say it's worth it so far. And but again, I'm I'm a story junkie here, and I just and the fact that it's called Citadel, and you're spending all this time on the Citadel, which is one of my favorite places in the whole Mass Effect universe. It's just gorgeous and massive. It's, uh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. I just, I, you, it's the same feel of that you always expect to see when you're at the Citadel, especially down in the wards. Everything's all dark. Everything's all dark, but brightly lit with neon. It's you got pumping music in the background. Even meet some different people. Even meet some people in the past. Some slightly minor characters. Maybe even one or two you haven't seen since Max Effect One. Hey, Kira, he's still alive, right? And yeah. also apparently taking a vacation. Like, well, I'm gonna laugh really hard if somehow Anderson shows up just like, how the heck did you get here? No, 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 no. I don't I think had that... a vacation. <laughs> you know why? Because I'm Anderson, alright? Now shut up. Okay, but... <laughs> no, I, well, like I said, I, I haven't run into anyone like added. Kira. And again, whether Kira he's alive or not depends on who you've got. And that's just the... And that's the thing I'm always wondering is how Bioware can so seamlessly go through this entire universe with different numbers of people, with different crews, with different d uh, people in the crew. Because so many key points in the game change depending on who you actually do or don't have. So I'm wondering how this all would work when you don't, ha when you don't have like a full team or if one person's missing or if this person died instead. Yeah, like I have to assume that the world of Mass Effect 3 is very depressing if you didn't play the first two games and just jumped right into the third. Well, yeah. Yeah, because, like, well, we covered this back when we did the Mass Effect 3 review, 
more than about a year ago now, yeah. uh, where it was like, Happy if birthday. you did not play Mass Effect 1 and you're just starting fresh on 3, Rex is dead. And um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's assumed you shot Rex. Yeah, you you can get the option, do you save Rex or do you shoot him? Mm, coin flip, okay, he's dead. Yeah, well, that, the, the game just decides if you do Yeah, the, the, one, the game just decides certain it. information yeah, about yeah, well. your quote-unquote decisions in one. Uh, I think... You probably killed the Rachni Queen in that version too. It's, it's in actually, it's in my, yeah, uh, it's in my guide over here in the other room. Yeah, but we've as got far as I know, yeah. everything is the worst yeah. possible situation if you start yeah. with no save information. Like yeah, everybody yes. from the suicide mission is dead, including Kelly and. I think Miranda made it. But well, I think yeah, that they might ha- be it. <laughs> yeah, they ha- I've seen people like, do- I've seen people do like the quote unquote blonde shepherd run where they try to make the worst decisions possible. Right. But like it, it kills, ma- they have as many people on the team die. Like you they, mentioned, like, um, you mentioned hmm? earlier while we were in the car send that uh, somebody played like a renegade archer. Oh no, you can totally look that up if you just do an internet search for uh, was it Mass Effect Renegade Archer? It's a, a Twitter feed that someone started. Some of the posts are actually really funny. Uh, Kotaku actually just featured the article. Uh, well, because you have to be careful, because Archer is the name of one of the scientists in um, Overlord. Yeah, yes, no. Dr. In, in this case, Archer, they're talking about the character Sterling Archer, Archer from, from the, the show, the, the titular character from the uh, television show. Hey, so yes, there's currently someone oh, on X-Files. Twitter with the name Archer Shepard who is playing a renegade playthrough of as Mass the Effect. character of Sterling Archer, basically. Uh, no, I'm pretty sure you can actually customize the face to be accurate. You just couldn't get the voice, which but, man, I mean, that's that's like the personality that he's basically. It, if I could somehow play off. Mass Effect Three with John H. Benjamin's voice replacing mm-hmm. uh, Mark Mears, Mark Mears, that'd be the most amazing playthrough ever. Uh, yeah. Here's some sample tweets: Cutting off the council is almost as satisfying as hanging up on mother. <laughs> you requisitions guy, give me a gun. Well, obviously, I don't remember your name. Just because I talk to you every day doesn't mean I care. <laughs> No, Jack, don't. You're so ugly when you cry. Uh, Harkening <laughs> back to the first one. Jesus, Garrus, could you try not getting shot? So are they using Garrus in place of, uh, God, I can't remember, uh, Brett? Holy shit, I just blew nine million credits in ten minutes. Oh yeah, that's okay, another thing. <laughs> that's another fun thing. I discovered just how rotten my luck is. Oh? Well, because one of the one of the new locations oh, you get... Th- that's me, right here. What? <laughs> Oh my god, I fucking hate Thresher Moss. Oh, there you go. Believe well, that. yeah, that's, well, everyone's got that, yeah. This isn't going on the radio. Oh, it's not? No. Shit, <laughs> shit, shit, balls, balls, balls. Okay, cut that. <laughs> now, say the seven words you, now say the seven words you can't say online. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> those Sweet, words. we're not editing for radio. Woo! Yeah, this are those is Spring Break Edition, like the names so of dragons? we are not going are on they just already because words? the studio will be closed. It's be pretty bad to not say it delicious. online. I don't know. You can say anything online as long as it's away from the innocent little children. It's just I'm 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 basically pulling a Reddit down vote on what Jeff said because the, the, there I go again slipping up on my imps, but it's I'm just fine. pulling a Reddit down vote on what Sen said because I felt it contributed nothing to the discussion. It, it didn't. I was just happy to be able to speak freely. Okay, well you anyway. can always speak freely. It's just I'm going to keep cutting you. Right. <laughs> the radio air will be bleep 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 Canadian government bleep 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 bleep. And if wow. she has to in cut any you case. enough, then she'll just start cutting you with knives, so be careful. Uh-huh. Right. Yes, well, like I was saying, I discovered how badly, how unlucky I am, because if any of you remember in Mass Effect 1, when you were at the... Uh, I forget what it was. It wasn't Korra's Den. It was one of the other places. Uh, but it had gambling in it, and it was space gambling. Well, you get to another casino in this DLC, and you have things like roulette and... What appears to be some kind of space age version of uh, blackjack, and one or two other, and one or two other futuristic games. I lost like ten thousand credits in like two minutes. I am just rotten at gambling, apparently. It's embarrassing, really. But it's all bright and colorful. And if you if you're on the roulette wheel, you actually can. If you lose, everyone around you goes aww. And if you win, there's a small like fireworks display on the front, and you like pump your fist, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it should be an in-universe gambling game that consists of playing an in-universe shooter where in the multiplayer you can buy equipment packs and then you're like, yay, I got a good equipment pack. So you want a game within a game? 
Yes. It's actually so, yeah. one of the best parts of Assassin's Creed 3, randomly, is that they have, like, super good in-game checkers implementations. <laughs> if you want to play checkers, Assassin's Creed 3 is the $60 title for you. Good to know. Well, in any case, um... What else can I rant on about this, about what I've played so far? Um... Hmm. I'm trying to think what I haven't already ranted about. Ugh. <sighs> is this too... Anything, I, anything else I might say might be too big of a spoiler. Alright, so we'll call it there then. Uh, well, I, any, will any, this, I will say this I'm sure you'll give us more of your thoughts next week. How about that? Indeed, I will say this much. Anyone that's a big fan of Liara, she gets some extra sassy lines, and I love Ooh. it. She's the sassy one. No, I'm the sassy one. No, no sorry, I'm Liara. The sassy one. No, I'm the sassy one. I have all the sass. I, I well, you are a sass. Well, he doesn't have a sass, so... <laughs> you have to make up for it somehow. No, seriously, it's just flat. <laughs> Send completely without sass. Well, at least I'm aerodynamic. Even planes need some curves, dude. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, okay, I will say one other thing, though. I'm not sure if I, I know everyone else, when it comes to their playthroughs on Mass Effect, have like their dream team, like the ones they always take with them, unless it's like mission specific, they have to take. Like Edie on this mission, they have to take Liara on this one, or Tali or whoever. I, I always have a problem whenever I'm taking my team out, because I'm always wanting to hear everyone's dialogue. So like I say, that's my favorite, the banter between everybody. So I want to hear everyone's dialogue given a different situation. It's particularly difficult in this one, because we get so many cool situations, and you get a <laughs> and there's an And if you have Rex, there's a chance to see what he looks like all dressed up. Oh. You know, like, like bloat, like I don't know what I don't know what his formal attire would look like, but there's a situation where you have to get dressed up like you did in Kasumi's DLC. Awesome. You know that's where that's where the that's where Shepard's dress comes. In. And am I the only one that thinks that Shepard doesn't look that good in that little black dress? I don't I don't know what it is. I, I, play as man I disagree. Shepard, he definitely doesn't look good in that little black dress. I, I think don't know she what, looks really silly, sprint or storming in those heels. But um, I don't know. There's just something weird about the way it's rendered. It might be. I forget, did you wear the dress around the ship? I totally you did, because I loved yes. it. Yeah, you did. Well, he was asking any, if I personally did, and the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, well, in any, yes, well, in any case, there's a, there's, a, there's a part just like... Because then I could show up and hit on people and be like, hey. Yes. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> yes, yeah, so, well, there is an option to dress up. I mean, no, not an option. There is a section, a mission, where you need to dress up like you did with Kazumi's, but you take along... Um, someone else, another person on the team. And in my case, my femship was romancing Liara and, you know, dressing up. We could do the whole James Bond thing. Going to the party is all smooth and sophisticated and such. But you have the option of taking Garrus, Tali, I mean, anyone else on the team, but you also can get Rex. So the, what I'm thinking is I'm going to be playing through this DLC a few more times just so I can see everyone's formal wear and see everyone's reactions to, the, to this, to this situation. Because <laughs> after I came back from it, I go over to Rex and says, "Didn't want to have a Krogan day, day, Shepard." Too much. <laughs> Some and <laughs> just more banter from him. Like, I love the banter. I just love the banter. Ooh, awesome. and I will. And, oh, and and which one is last, why you like this podcast? Yes, I love this. I love this. But, but, sparkle, sparkle. but seriously, this one is like, this one's like full of banter between the team, between the teammates, and I love that. It's just totally <laughs> it's thought the, you were going to start chugging out the bottle. Not gonna lie. What? Uh, oh. Sen and I are drinking. Oh, of course. Um, there is rum happening. But I will, I will say this one. I, I, I'll, I'll keep going for another hour or so of ranting on stuff. And, uh, and you haven't just even played that long. I haven't even played that long. But I'll just say I love this so far. I think it, it, it has the makings of being a really good send off to the Mass Effect universe. I'm looking forward to seeing how it ends. But I will say one other thing that will get anyone else interested that has that's on the window that's on the fence about it. But. <laughs> Oh, and there is, is. A, there is there is a section of the of one of the quests where the mission objective is to mingle. That's what you need to do. You have to mingle. There are even so nav- more banter. No, 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 yeah, but but you have nav points that say mingle. Go here, 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 and mingle. <laughs> Does that consist of overhearing people having conversations and then telling one of them that they're right and the other one is wrong? No, no, no. It means going up and actually directly talking with people. You one know. or two. One or two, you may or may not know from. Socializing. Yes, I, I know a bunch of like a bunch of our listeners who are shut-ins just collectively crap themselves. Yes, well, <laughs> we have listeners. 
Uh-huh. You talk to them, dude, not me. Socializing isn't so bad when you have save states. Yeah, I messed that one up. Time for a new one. Yeah, could you, like, forget I said any of that and we'll start over? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine how interaction would work if that was how, like, any of this actually worked? Life would be awesome. Everybody would be super slick at all times and nobody would ever stutter or make mistakes. It'd be kind of weird. Fun mathematical fact. There are eight possible crew members in Mass Effect 3, and the combinatorially eight choose two means that you would have to make 28, although really 27 because the combination of Kaiden and Ashley is invalid, but you would have to play through Mass Effect 3 27 times in order to hear all of the character character dialogue. That's a lot of playthroughs. True enough. But some people, I'm sure, have already done that. There's worse yep. ways to spend your time. True enough. But all I can say is, I absolutely love this DLC so far, and I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes. All right. So, Snake Sam. out. <laughs> <laughs> He's done. Reject him into space. Excuse me. Get the airlock. What have you done to justify your life in this past seven days? Uh, which of us is that directed at? Sen. Sen, justify Sen. your existence. I'm currently learning how to make meatballs. Mm. Fair enough, he's going to be making me food, you are excused. <laughs> <laughs> I win! I want to put your balls into my mouth. They're but not really, because I'm a vegetarian, so that won't work. Yeah. I, I don't want your balls in my mouth anymore, Sen, now that I've thought about it a little yeah, longer. Yeah, they are not vegan friendly. <sighs> if this is just going to be a bunch of further he's ball jokes, I'm just going to leave right now. Anyway, <laughs> Y'all can finish this right now. It's that kind of night. Um, I, I can be out of here right now. I, I got some yeah. DLC to play. You know, I can get out of here. So, I so have I'm been... going to be playing uh, Tomb Raider. You can uh, totally. I have been uh, reading up on the game Infinity by Corvus Valley. A, a uh, squad-based sci-fi uh, game. As opposed to a real life sized squad based uh, no, sci fi thing? Skirmish, as in it's not army based. So we're not talking like War Machine or Warhammer 40. You said miniature, with... and I was making fun of you. Okay. <laughs> Just to um, clarify. So yeah, rather than Warhammer 40K or War Machine, where you'll have dozens of miniatures on the table, pretty much the largest force you're ever going to raise in Infinity is going to be about 10 models. So somewhere between 8 and 10. That makes the name somewhat ironic. I just hope that you'd have infinite models on the table. The term infinity comes from the actual backstory of the game, which is amazingly written. Like, it is frightening the amount of detail that they put into this world just in the first source book, because what you have is not an alternate history of the Earth that has led to this universe, but a continuation of already existing nations that have just split up in the face of various catastrophes, to reform themselves, and so when the game setting picks up 175 years into the future, humanity is a very different thing than what we have now. And so each of the game's factions represent either new forces that have uh, come into existence since modern times, or a reorganization of nations that actually exist on Earth. Uh, So, for instance, what you have as kind of the, the main guys, the space marines of... Infinity are the Pan-Oceania nation, which is actually formed from uh, most of the European countries, but also Australia and New Zealand. And so they're represented by the groups of people who stayed on Earth for the longest period of time, but who also survived the economic collapse of the rest of the world because they were all stable countries. So by the time Infinity picks up, this is actually the most powerful nation. Uh, on the other hand, you have the Ariadna, who are made up of the United States, Canadians, English, Scottish, Irish, and uh, Russians. All of the big super Western superpowers in the world who, when their economies collapsed, kind of banded together and were the first people to explore space, who then kind of got abandoned there for a hundred years. And so they're actually the least technologically advanced of all of the groups in the game because they were kind of left out of everything. This is reminding me of Rifts and Shadowrun. Yeah, it, it's very much on that level of sci-fi as Shadowrun. Um, there are 
two alien factions in the game currently, the Combined Army, which is pretty much exactly the Covenant from Halo, who are led by what they call the Evolved Intelligence, which is just this... Because everything's derivative. <laughs> yeah, it, it's an alien super brain that is running the entire society towards a final evolutionary point. And the other race is the Toha, who are the only alien race to resist the Combined Army and have been secretly manipulating the humans for some time. Uh, the final race I'm going to describe, which there are actually two more, I guess I can cover them, um, the Yu Jing. So everything you just said was a lie. Yeah, that was a complete lie. You can edit out that sentence. That's fine. I know you won't, but it's there. Um, the Yu Jing are basically the Asian populations that have all formed into one society, uh, led by what was the Chinese, uh, the Immortal Emperor. But that... That faction combines Korean elements, Japanese elements, Chinese elements, all into one faction. Because that would ever happen, right? <laughs> one superpower is all it would take. Mm. Which, if your options are stay on the earth and die, or come with us and leave and live, people tend to follow that. Uh, the final human faction in the game is called Hak Islam, uh, or New Islam which is the Islamic nations getting under the banner of a reformed Islamic nation that doesn't practice fundamental Islam, but actually follows a very uh, peaceful, humanistic form of Islam that has spread. And while they only have one planetary system, they're one of the most powerful forces in the galaxy. They actually have the most doctor-type units out of the entire game, seeing as medicine and human worth are paramount uh, pillars of that religion. Uh, the last faction is the Aleph, which is actually the name of the AI that runs all of the human interactions. You know, it It is the internet of the future. It is the thing that keeps the factions from going to all-out war with each other, and it is humanity's protector. But, this being the future, it is allowed to protect itself, and so it has created its own security force out of various AIs that it's created, as well as artificial humans, uh, called post-humans, that it's developed. Really obscure, nerdy pun alert. Aleph is a character that is used in mathematical notations for Infinity. No, that is actually and... why that name was used. Like, the game is completely aware of the derivatives of all of its terminology. I would hope so. What, did you think that they were just like, I don't know what this name means, but it sounds cool, some so we're gonna use it. Some sci-fi does that, and like, each unit in the game is named something different, so all of the Aleph units are actually named out of Greek mythology, and, uh, and actually Hindu mythology as well. And the derivatives of the name are act actually make sense when you think about what the unit does. So yeah, it, it's really surprising what this game system does. Uh, one of the cooler facts about it is each faction in the game uh, actually has a historical figure that has been cloned uh, uh, given a new body and brought back to life, and it's representative of what the faction idol uh, idealizes. So, for instance, the Ariadna, the humans who were stranded on a planet for hundreds of years, got William Wallace cloned for them. And he's currently leading in them in their struggle against the other factions. The, uh, the Pan Oceania got Joan of Arc because they're a very religious faction. And so they wanted someone who is not only powerful on the battlefield, but who the men would follow and the women would idealize. <laughs> um, the Yu Jing picked Sun Tzu as their representative. Aleph was just like, you know what, no living human has ever been good enough for the AI. We're going to make fictional characters. So they took uh, Achilles and all of the characters from the Iliad as their, uh, as their named character leaders. All right, then. You know, greatest warrior in, in all of fiction. Yeah, we'll take him. I don't know. If you're selecting from any fictional character as your representative, Achilles is kind of a bad choice, because he failed. Yeah, but you can't really pick Superman, because cloning the body for him would be more than a little difficult. Well, all you need to do for Achilles is give him extra strong boots. Yep, and he's got them. I figure well, you just you take go. Achilles, and then you just chop his feet off and give him, like, a peg leg. Yeah. So, Cyborg legs. while most of the factions have uh, these things called tags, which are basically giant mech suits that are like three times the size of a person, Achilles is considered a tag in and of himself. He's just human-sized. Like, he has the statistics of one of these giant suits in the game. And likewise, he costs an appropriate amount, but it's just funny to see the things he does on the table. But yeah, um, 
Game-wise, it's usually played on a 4x4 table, uh, which is, you know, that that's not huge. You can set up something on a coffee table and just keep up a 4x4 board somewhere in your home. It's not like uh, Warhammer 40k where you need something along the lines of a 4x6 table, which is enormous and takes up most of a room. Madness! Uh, the unfortunate thing about this is, because of the way Infinity works, every model can shoot pretty much across the table if it wants, and it's just a, a lower and lower chance as to whether you'll hit or not. You need tons of terrain to play this game. Like, we're talking upwards of $100 price range terrain, which the company does make. They have some very nice uh, cut board terrain that they sell from MicroArt Studios that's officially licensed by the company. Likewise, they have the, the really cool uh, plastic billboards, the hollow display billboard scenery that mm -hmm. I showed you today. Yeah. That's just kind of neat. Like, I love the idea that as you're fighting in this, ur in this urban environment, there's an advertisement for, uh, was it, Big Joe's School of Negotiation? Yes. Well, I suppose if you need sci-fi terrain, I don't see where advertising wouldn't fit in that. Yeah, it's, it's cool. Advertising is a it. huge part of our culture right now. Right. It's unfortunate that you have to buy it, though. <laughs> you have to buy the ads! Oh my god, Adception. I just found the irony there. Um, no, it, it's kind of unfortunate. I mean, they're that... ads for fictional things that don't exist yet. Right. Or do they? To play Infinity, you need a full board worth of stuff. Otherwise, it's going to be a really generic game. And uh, likewise, the, one of the unfortunates is when the game was Read initially form. released... The only objective of playing the game was kill each other. Have the only models left on the board. That has since been corrected in the third book release, the Campaign Paradiso book, which added an actual scenario system to the game, you know, giving you objectives besides shoot the enemy dude, which I think you always need in a miniature game. You, you can't just have the option be, yeah, kill, kill the enemy, because you're going to always hit a situation where either your model can't kill theirs or their playing in a different way that prevents you from completing that objective. But yeah, so far, um, the models are absolutely gorgeous for this game. Like, that—that that is what drew me in, the complete sci-fi look of the models, and they have a full website, it's uh, infinity-the-game. Uh, it's translated from Spanish, the, the game Corvus Valley is definitely a, uh, a Spanish company, but at the same time, uh, the translations work, they're functional. It's a little rough in some spots in the first book, but you can work through it. Uh, the company has released a series of YouTube videos for the game that are phenomenal, both in explaining the backstory of each of the factions, as well as providing ground rules for the game. And you can look those up through the website. They have a great get, getting started section, where they actually recommend um, tournament size armies for each of the factions that come out to uh, less than $130 for each faction. I know $130 sounds like a lot to people who don't play miniature games, but like comparatively to a Warhammer 40,000 tournament size army, which is usually somewhere around the I lines think of like, $600 to $800. What was it? On, on the scale of expensive mini games, I think at the top we have Warhammer 40k, and then just under that we have War, War Machine. Machine, and just under that we have Malifaux. And <laughs> yeah, I, I really feel like Infinity is... You just keep going on the cheaper. Infinity is one of the cheapest games to get into. Um, the books are a little bit expensive, since the books are all hardcover and fully colored. I'm having flashbacks to when Malifaux came out, JSYK. Yeah. Well, it, it's very much along the same lines as Malifaux. Um, the rules per miniature are definitely simpler than Malifaux. Uh, now, there's not even cards for these, right? No. No, the game does not include cards. But what you get instead is uh, there are two Which means that we can't go and get these laminated and freak out all my former co-workers when we bring in little cardboard pictures of dead hookers. Right. <laughs> Is he okay? Yeah, he's fine. So yeah, um, Infinity is looking really cool. I'm, I'm looking really forward to sitting down and play it. It's all uh, played with D20s. Uh, one of the coolest... Which is, oh, so that's why you bought three more. Yeah. Well, the unofficial tagline for the game, which I absolutely love, is it's always your turn. Uh, basically, that means that even when it's the opponent's turn... You can, you still have the option to react to what they're doing. So, say they decide to move a miniature out of cover and into the line of sight of some of your miniatures. Your models can decide, okay, we're going to take reaction shots and we're going to fire at this guy for coming into our view. Um, if the enemy decides to shoot at you, you can take what's called an active response order, which basically allows your guy to either dodge out of the way of the shots 
uh, to take a free move, basically, to get out of sight, or fire back, which can actually prevent your guy from getting hit and possibly even take out the enemy. It's all very methodical on how you have to plan this game. Uh, one of the other things that I'll quote is uh, the website Bell of Lost Souls, which is a 40k website, but they do talk about other games. Uh, the guy who's been writing about Infinity lately actually had the quote, um, it's not your list, it's you. Meaning that if you're not winning the game and you're finding a lot of flaws with it, chances are it's not that you're playing less powerful things or, or you're playing weaker models. It's just you're not playing it correctly. You, you should think about this. <laughs> doing it wrong. You are doing it wrong. It's not the game's fault. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely enjoying this. I picked up the Aleph as my uh, as my faction because I'm totally into the uh, the cyber AI theme. Also, the AI that rules the entire human race makes a great benevolent villain, I'll call it. Yeah, that is... Inf- Only a little bit benevolent. It's totally benevolent. It's helping. It, it wants everyone to be good. It's just protecting itself. Making sure you guys aren't too dumb. Benevolently slaughtering people. It's not even slaughtering people. It's it's a covert ops unit. All right. It just goes enough. where it's needed. If it's needed, you know where a lot of people are. Then so be it. You did it. it. Wasn't the AI's choice? Okay. So that's infinity. Yep. <gasps> Bixie, what have you been up to this week? Um, not a whole lot. Uh, like I said, I bought Tomb Raider today, and I'm gonna go play that after the show. Because we had to crank this out, but um, so I'm definitely going to talk about that next week. Uh, I th- what I really like about the visual design of Tomb Raider, which is one the hair, and I guess this is part of they have some fancy new hair technique that they call tresses, but they they have really good hair in that game, and two the arms because the characters in the new Tomb Raider have beefy arms and. I like, I apparently like arms in art to just be as big as possible, because that was one of my favorite things about the art style of How to Train Your Dragon, is that the Vikings just had arms that were dramatically thicker than their own heads, and I was like, I love it. I just want more of this. They have big arms in Tomb Raider, and I like that. Is anyone else getting a little uncomfortable right now? No? Well, okay, at one point me. I had said that I was really into the Tomb Raider art style, and Pixie had responded very correctly with, it seems to be a lot of brown, <laughs> which it certainly is. But I, well, I think I've picked out why I liked it. Well, to be fair, that's not specifically limited to Tomb Raider as so much as it is anything currently coming out. I wouldn't say so. Mass Effect 3 just came yeah. out, and uh, it's not very brown at all. Well, Tuchaka is, but that makes the green bits well, pop out more. Okay, yes, and I just went on an entire rant about going on the Citadel, and, and it's, it uses every color but brown. Yep. Okay, so what I meant to say is that everything is Call of Duty related is brown. <laughs> Still haven't played that. But yes, I have to agree with you, the entire design and look of the whole world looks very impressive. And you are welcome to come over and play it with me um, when you come over later this week. So, there we go. Looking forward to it. And the whole... And <laughs> obviously, the whole thing is probably going. Yeah, all of it's going to focus is on what they do with Lara as a character, obviously, because like many characters that have been so well grounded and so well connected with the gaming universe, she's kind of stagnated. She's kind of just become, I don't know, a paper cutout now because we don't really know. It's hard to really get invested in her anything that beyond the obvious, but everyone, every review seems to be gloating on this is one that's actually pushing Lara as a character. You genuinely are caring and wanting to see her survive. Try and do everything you can to just make sure she gets through all this. But she's also not a damsel in distress kind of character, or she starts out like that and then she has to grow. She has no choice but to grow beyond that. And If they truly pull that off, I, I would definitely look forward to getting this game. So we'll find out when I come back with a review next week. Yes. Uh, in the meantime, I've been playing. I've been trying to go through, and basically, I've, I'm missing. I'm missing a couple of achievements left from 100%ing uh, Mass Effect Two. Uh, 
name, but they all basically revolve around going through on Insanity. And so I'm doing an Insanity playthrough. And I hemmed and hawed and was indecisive for a while over how exactly I was going to go about doing that, like what class to pick, what bonus powers to take, things like that. Uh, I ended up ultimately deciding on a Sentinel for the Overload and Warp powers on the same character so that I could deal with both shields and armor and biotic barriers uh, at the same time. On my own. I didn't need to make sure that I brought other party members with me that could do either of those things. Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. every enemy on you know, Insanity has some kind of protection, so... That's well, only fair. I mean, you've got it, too. Yep, yeah, there's a lot more of them than there are of me. Touche. But you're Commander Shepard. Was there ever a final word on if the fact that you could bind Incinerate to one of the number keys on the PC version of Mass Effect 3 and then cast it on enemies that still had shields and it would do damage against them was a bug or not? Because it was super OP. No, like, as an infiltrator, you could cast Incinerate on anybody and just win. Yeah, Incinerate will always do damage. It's just a matter of how uh, much. From the overlay, it's it'll just straight up refuse on, um, to cast shields, it though. on enemies who have shields. Yeah, you can't use it. It's only on uh, health bars. You can't mm -hmm. set someone on fire if they have a shield. Really? Because I set people on fire all the time. In the With game? Shields. Yeah. I, I suspect I that this was a bug in Mass Effect 3, because I also did that, and... I, I'm not Actually, finding I, any strong evidence. My engineer throws incinerate on people all the are time. Are you using the quick shortcuts, though, or are you yeah. pulling it up from the menu? I'm doing the quick shortcuts. Yeah, see, that's what I he's sure talking is... about, is the quick shortcuts are enabling a bug workaround. I thought that was just if a feature If you pull it up on the menu, it will tell you that you're not supposed to be able to yeah. do that. It's in no way efficient. It's like, by all means, itself. I should be throwing uh, overload at them instead, but I can hit them with the uh, incinerate just fine. It just doesn't do much damage. It slowly burns out their shield. Like, the initial thing might not be doing damage. It might just be the damage over time that's hitting the shield. Yeah, it doesn't seem to have a problem. Mm. In any case, I'm, I'm not finding any strong evidence with a quick Google search that it was a bug, but it certainly is OP for uh, infiltrators. But regardless, this isn't for Mass Effect 2, which is what you were playing. Well, I think your strategy makes sense. Fair enough. Have you been finding it difficult? Uh, insanity, as it turns out, kind of hard. Who'd have thunk it? Um... No, I'm, d I'm doing okay. I've been... I didn't start dying, really, until I got to Omega. Um, this, is the first, this is the first mission that I went to after getting done with the tutorial, basically. And I went and I got, did the Archangel mission, got Garrus, and now I'm working on picking up Morton. Yeah, going through the... Yeah, going through the plague areas. Yeah, that's a hard. That's a hard part of the game. And it's um, I. I've discovered that the uh, Sentinel is very very squishy. Like that extra tech armor doesn't really help you much on insanity. <laughs> that's more crowd control than anything. It, it seems. Um, it just softens them up so that hopefully your NPC allies can really do the bulk work of the damage dealing. And frankly, they're idiots, so they're not very good at it. I might, depending well, on whether or not I can get through this picking up Morden thing, I might give up on this Sentinel and try a different character class and see if one of those are easier. Uh, I, I wanted to get a character that had Overload so that I could import that and use it to simultaneously knock off the uh, use Overload 100 times achievement on Mass Effect 3, but that probably isn't going to work. So is this your first rodeo with playing a Mass Effect game on a super high difficulty? Uh, I have tried it before. No, I was actually working on an Insanity playthrough of Mass Effect 3 uh, about five months ago, I would say. But the problem is I, in the shuffle of moving like my save files around and getting a new hard drive, and I was doing that on a Vanguard. And I was doing really well at it, actually. I picked up Javik, and I hadn't died until... I hadn't died at all until... Well, oh, until most of the way... Yeah, I got all the way through Mars, and I got most of the way through picking up Javik. It was... Yeah, it was on my way out of those tight corners where they started set, the engineers started setting up turrets that I started to have problems. 
But, um, yeah, no, I love my Vanguard. The Jedi with the shotgun. I, uh, I absolutely love using my biotic charge. It's amazing. So I might... No doubt. Uh, the only problem is, yeah, with those extra protections on uh, Insanity, I don't think that it'll be all that practical. So I was try I was making a pretty good attempt at a Mass Effect 3 Insanity run-through with my Vanguard, but I lost that save file um, when I got a new hard drive. So I gotta start over. And then you pulled Darth Vader right there. Indeed. Um, but this is all really super dated information, and we've, we're kind of running a little long as it is. Uh, you guys in favor of killing it for the week until we actually get more content to go through? I think Daniel's done a pretty good job of carrying the game here. <laughs> so I would have could. I just we can, ramble. We could cut that, I guess, if you'd prefer not use Lord, your name. Lord, I was born a rambling man. All right, now we're cutting it. <laughs> Anyhow. All right, I'll do our outro, and then we'll be good to go. All right, so join us next week when uh, I have a review done for us for the new Tomb Raider reboot. I'll be playing on the Xbox 360. Uh, we got anything else pl planned for next week? World domination. Uh, well, I mean, I'll be finishing the DLC. Oh, yeah, and we'll probably have the rest of uh, Mass Effect Citadel done too. Uh, how about that? I'll probably have played through it a few times by then. All right. We'll once again be sitting on a day where something has come out, but we haven't played it yet for Heart of the Swarm. Indeed. That sounds like well, a it'll challenge. Be swarm in a challenge accepted, son. Heck no, I like sleep. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I oh, thought. Snap. Anyhow, in well, the, the meantime, the swarm will be in our hearts. In the meantime, Sorry. I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. I'm Pyrosim. And I'm Snake. And you've been listening to Nerd Talk. Catch you next week. <laughs>